Welcome to today's uh, introduction about, on ES67 and SD2110 as part of the uh, Ravenna 2020 webinar series. My name is Andreas Hildebrand. I'm working as Ravenna Technology Evangelist. Um, I've been in the broadcast business for more than 25 years. Um, the current company is ALC Networks, which was founded back in 2008, and its sole purpose uh, was is was is the development of the Rana technology, which had been introduced exactly 10 years ago. Uh, that's why this year we hope to be able to have a celebration later this year. Well, we will see how the situation developed. Anyway, this is the 10th years, uh, 10th year of Ravenna in the market. All right, so let's have a brief look at what standards are relevant uh, when we look at the field of audio over IP or media over IP in general. Of course, it's the AES 67 standard, which defines high performance audio over IP interoperability. We have the ST2110 standard. Uh, it is accompanied by the, by the ST2059 standard, uh, which basically defines the elementary essence data transport on managed network by SEMT. Uh, there's then ANMOS um, uh, definitions out there, which are provided by AMBA, the Advanced Media Workflow Association, which define um, upper layer operational and management functionalities which accompany AS67 or 2110. AS uh, is also uh, having a standard uh, which is called AS70, which is about device control and connection management. And there are some new work going on. There's, of course, lots of work going on, but uh, particularly relating to AS67 is the X242 uh, group, which defines or is about to define real-time audio metadata transport over IP. Um, so that uh, all the uh, new audio application which require real-time metadata can also work in conjunction with AES67. Today, we're only focusing on AES67 and 2110. That's already enough um, to talk about. Uh, and this seminar is going to be a basic introduction to what AES67 and 2110 uh, define and what they are being built on. Uh, let's have a quick look first at AES67. So what is the original goal of AS67? Basically to provide a method of uh, making disparate audio over IP systems interoperable with each other. So what is AS67 exactly? It's a standard, which is called interoperability standard for high performance audio over IP networks. Uh, it's important that AS67 has not invented anything new. It's just uh, based on existing protocols and trusted IT standards. So we're just looking at what is suitable to comprise a uh, interoperability standard for AOIP so that it can work in coexisting with other uh, IT services and traffic flows and uh, so that AES67 will uh, achieve a high adoption rate by all major solution providers. So the problem statement we were facing uh, um, with when we were starting AES67 was we had uh, quite a number of audio over IP uh, solutions. We uh, assumed that it is much easier to have interoperability and connectivity based on, a, uh, on IP instead of uh, using um, analog or digital audio links. The problem we were presented with is compatibility among these different solutions. So it was just not possible to connect down to Toravena or to QLAN or QSYS system um, at that time. Um, there's another simple illustration for, the, for this uh, dilemma. Um, we have all these different uh, audio over IP solutions already in the market. They are all based on IP, but they can't talk to each other. Um, well, we removed this remedy already on a, um, uh, on a direct uh, cooperation with um, Axia Telos at uh, 2012. So Ravenna and Livewire were able to directly communicate uh, even without AES 67. But finally, AES 67 was the goal to provide a solution for this interoperability mismatch. How is such an in, uh, interoperability mismatch possible? Well, if you look at uh, all these solutions, they are built uh, upon a number of um, functional blocks, which you can see on the left. And if you look uh, closer into any of these individual existing solutions, you can see that at certain areas, they are using different mechanisms or protocols than the others. And if you make an overall picture, you will see that there are uh, a number of um, uh, differences uh, in, in these uh, or between these solutions, which finally would render interoperability in any of these functional blocks impossible. 
So then AES67 had the task to find a definition or to solve this problem by defining protocols, functional blocks, which cover exactly all these areas, except for control and monitoring. And uh, finally, AES67 came up with definitions, which by now are adopted by all these different solution providers, so that with AES67, we can make direct IP-based connections among all of these different uh, AOIP solutions. So let's have a closer look into how this is going to be achieved or how this is basically achieved. Um, this is not going to be a very deep technical presentations. We will have that in, uh, coming up in two weeks, but I will at least provide a few uh, hints um, and hooks so that you, if you're interested, um, can search um, for yourself and start uh, learning on individual um, components, functions, protocols, if you like. So let's start with the most basic functionality. We need synchronization. Anything which runs over IP has to be synchronized just uh, as digital connections. Um, so for synchronizations, we were uh, looking at a standard industry protocol, which is called IEEE 1588, or otherwise better known as precision time protocol. Um, and particularly at the 2008 released version, which is PTP version two. So with PTP, we distribute absolute time uh, throughout the system so that every component on the system has exact same understanding of time. Now, if uh, a system has understanding of time or has an absolute precise time, um, it can generate any media clock, any frequency it needs out of that precise time. And for AA67, uh, we were mandating for 48 kilohertz audio media clock to be supported. So here's an illustration how this basically works. Let's assume we have a master clock that may or may not be synchronized to GPS. Uh, GPS synchronization basically is only required if you have um, you know, internet networking uh, interoperability where you want to bridge between two different locations, let's say uh, Frankfurt to Washington or uh, two stadiums uh, which are set apart. But in a local system, GPS is not required. However, it's always necessary to have one wall clock, which we call the master clock. Now, the time of the master clock is uh, being distributed to all the participating devices, we call them slave nodes, through this PTP protocol. Now, all these slave nodes have the very precise or very exact same time as the master clock. This can basically go into the uh, nanoseconds uh, precision range. And when and if they have time, uh, the exact same time as the master clock, they can generate their media clocks independently from each other. But since the time is accurately enough, all the media clocks would be the same. So if I tell a device to generate 48 kilohertz out of its local time, it's the very same 48 kilohertz the other device will generate out of its local time because all these local times are precisely synchronized to the master clock. So in uh, a sense, we have locally generated media clocks which are absolutely synchronized uh, with respect to each other, just as I would have run a house clock uh, or red clock distribution among devices. So the next layer we need is transport. Of course, we just don't want to have not only synchronization, we also want to have transport of media. So for transport, we use the RTP protocol, which runs over UDP, IP, both in unicast and multicast transport modes. So let's have a closer look at this. Um, if we are talking about network connectivity. We can't avoid talking about the OSI model. The OSI model is basically a layered model uh, which describes communication uh, between any two network devices or applications on the network. It has seven layers. We have a physical layer describing the physical connection like copper, fiber, wireless, whatever. There's a data link layer which is already a packet layer. It's better known as the ethernet layer. And then on top of the Ethernet layer, we have the IP layer. That's the first layer we want to look at. So as you can see, um, there's the IP protocol, which is also a packet-based protocol on top of Ethernet, but it provides routable packet addressing. So now with IP, packets can leave our local Ether network through means of uh, IP addresses. On top of the IP protocol, we use the UDP protocol for our media applications. Most of you have heard about TCP IP, um, which basically means we are using TCP on IP, but for our purposes, we want to use UDP because 
and I'm not going into details here, it's more lightweight and it provides um, uh, lower latencies uh, for the packet transports. So on top of the UDP protocol, there is the RTP protocol, the real-time transport protocol, which we finally use for transporting the payload or the media data. So that is the structure RTP over UDP over IP on top of any suitable network connection. All right, so the real-time transport protocol is defined in another standard, which is called RFC 3550. If you're not aware about the terminology, RFC is an abbreviation stands for request for comment. Nobody wants you to comment anymore because that has been done long, long time ago. Um, this is just the way the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, calls uh, or names their standards. And they just get uh, um, incremental numbers, basically. So RFC 3550 defines a format agnostic transport protocol for any sort of real-time media data. Again, you see the OZ layer on the left, the seven layers, and RTP lives on the session layer or the fifth layer counted from the bottom, on top of UDP, IP, and so on. Now, this is how an RTP packet actually looks like. Um, there is an RTP header, which is um, always in place. It's always 12 bytes. It carries a number of important information for the uh, receiver. There's the payload area where the media data actually lives in or is being transported in, the audio or video data or whatever is being transported within the RTP packet. And most important, RTP packets also have means for synchronization and that's the timestamp field. It's a 32-bit timestamp field, which is uh, going to be used for synchronization against the real-time clock and for alignment of multiple streams on the network uh, against um, uh, each other. Not going into details here, this is again something for the uh, presentation of the webinar coming up in 14 days, also for the webinar which is on the schedule, uh, which particularly talks about uh, synchronization and alignment in 2110 and AS67 uh, later next month. All right, so then uh, we, uh, I, I told you we have to support unicast and multicast. I, Thing multicast, unicast is pretty much clear to everyone. If not, here's a very uh, quick single uh, slide on it. Unicast usually describes a situation where a sender directly communicates to one receiver. So it's a one to one communication on the network. Uh, whereas multicast, we have one sender with, which is concurrently sending out its information to a number of receivers uh, uh, which are interested in that particular information. There's a third option uh, to transport data on a network, which is called broadcast. That is when a sender transmits data to all connected devices in the network. However, this is not very usable in our situation because that certainly would overflow um, our networks uh, taking the large amount of data into amount uh, which is carried by, let's say, video uh, streams. So unicast and multicast are the two uh, mechanisms we are looking at. Uh, in our situation, unicast would mean whenever a server or sender is sending out something to a receiver, it has to send that particular stream uh, ad address in a manner so that the switches and routers know where to route that particular stream. That's IP unicasting. If several receivers want to receive the same stream, uh, the server has to send out the same individual or the same stream uh, multiple times to the individual receivers. So in other words, if 100 receivers want to have the very same uh, stream data, um, it has to generate 100 different unicast streams. Not very useful in a situation where we really have a lot of receivers who want to uh, subscribe to the same content. That's where multicast kicks in. Uh, in multicast, the sender only sends out a multicast stream once and it is due to the intelligence of the network. And this is again standardized in the uh, RFCs that the networks know where to forward a particular multicast stream to so that an interested receiver gets um, the relevant stream data. The receiver in this case is not getting it automatically. It has to require um, to be part of that what we call multicast group. So it's sending out a request into the network and the network itself will then uh, copy and distribute the streams wherever it is necessary. The benefit clearly is on any um, particular network link, as you can see, there is only one stream flowing once at a certain time. Of course, if I'm sending out more multicast streams, they might 
be populate might populate the network at other places as well, but for a particular stream, it is only visible on each network uh, link once, but it reaches all the var uh, various receivers who have subscribed to that multicast stream. So that's unicast versus multicast. Both transport schemes are part of AS67 and need to be supported. Next up is quality of service. Quality of service, as the name already says, is um, prioritizing different traffic types against each other. We need this because you can imagine that in mixed traffic environments like a standard office network or a production network, there will not only be audio or video flows, there might be a lot of different uh, sort of traffics, web browsing, email, or maybe a file copy from the uh, uh, video file server to the editing station. And what we definitely need to avoid that our real-time traffic is disturbed um, interrupted by um, any other sort of traffic. So we want to prioritize our packets against each other packets. So what happens is uh, with a mechanism which is called differentiated services, which is another RFC standard, um, we use three traffic classes to actually uh, prioritize the uh, sync packets, the PTP packets, and the audio or video packets against all others. So these packets receive what we call a tag. Now, and the switches in the network look at these tags and can clearly identify which packets have higher priority, so which packets need prioritized forwarding or expedited forwarding when it comes to forwarding that packet to a particular output or egress port. Now, if that sounds familiar to you, uh, well, you're right. This is exactly what happens at each boarding gate where we have different lanes of uh, let's say first class, business class and economy class passengers. And that passenger who is carrying a uh, business class ticket goes into the second queue. The one with the uh, first class ticket goes into the maximum priority queue. And so the egress scheduler, the girl uh, at the counter who is forwarding one passenger after uh, the other is looking at those priority tags. So as long as there's a first class passenger waiting, that one gets in front of all the other passengers or packets. So whenever there's a PTP packet coming to the switch, it is immediately forwarded, even if there's a queue waiting in the lower prioritized um, uh, buffers. That's the way QoS works. So we can make sure that our sync packets and real-time packets always get uh, preferred or expedited forwarding in a network. Okay, next building block is what actually is being transported in the RTP packets. Of course, with AS67, it's audio, but audio still can follow a number of formatting options, like how many bits of audio per sample, how many channels in a particular stream, what uh, sampling frequencies, and how many of those sample frames per packet. Now, if this uh, sounds a bit uh, curious to you, here's an example how things can be encoded. Um, first of all, here's a line which you can ignore for the moment, but it's important. Uh, we have a maximum payload size uh, for real-time packets, which cannot exceed 1,460 bytes total per one packet, or with AS67 restrictions, only 1,440 bytes. So each packet does not is not allowed to exceed this particular payload size. That is because we want to avoid packet fragmentation at the network layer, which is not a very good thing um, usually. So here are coding examples. We have uh, three examples. For example, when we go with 16-bit uh, linear encoded audio, and that's the PCM audio is the uh, only thing AS67 uh, is addressing. So we can transport two channels, stereo, uh, with 48 samples, which uh, is one millisecond at 48 kilohertz, which would require 192 bytes out of that particular payload. So this particular RTP packet would be 192 bytes would have an 129 bytes payload size. We could also have a 24-bit stream with otherwise the same formatting parameters. Of course, the size increases here, and we can have an eight-channel stream, for example, wherever that makes sense, um, which then has a better payload utilization. It fills the packet up to 1,152 bytes. All these three examples are all mandatory to be supported in AS67. So, in other words. Any AS67 implementation, any receiver implementation needs to be able to deal with these examples uh, which I've given you. So basically, AS67, so 1624 bit PCM has to be supported. Any channel number between one and eight, uh, 
48 samples or one millisecond is the mandatory packet time, 48 kilohertz, the only mandatory sampling frequency, but AS67 also looked at um, you know, uh, applications on the side with um, lower latency requirements or higher um, uh, sample frequency requirements. So they made other variations optionally available for AS67, let's say four millisecond packet time, which would support stereo 192 samples at 16 bit without exceeding the maximum packet size or 96 kilohertz um, formatting where we have instead of 48 samples, then 96 samples in one packet at one millisecond, which of course it contributes to this particular packet size. Um, however, other applications can also use uh, totally different uh, packetization formats, for example, Ravenna, is capable of supporting MADI over IP. So with Ravenna, we can uh, send out 64 channels, let's say at seven samples or even one sample per packet, which gives a very high packet rate and a very, very low latency. And the only thing we are also always have to uh, watch is that we don't exceed a um, packet size of 1,440 bytes or 1,460 bytes total. So you see there's a number of variations possible with the transport of the payload within RTP. So how does the receiver actually know what is being transported in the current RTP stream he's receiving? Well, here's the next building block, which comes into game is the session description. The session description follows another standard, the RFC 4566, plus uh, a new one, which is 70, 73, 72, 73, SDP session description protocol. So the session description protocol is required, is always required, to describe the stream format and synchronization uh, which is being sent out uh, for a stream which is being sent out by a sender. So it has to be provided by a sender or its management instance for each stream individually. So for every outgoing stream, there will be an SDP, an SDP description, which describes exactly what is in the stream and where it's synchronized. So the good thing is the SDP is fully human readable because it's a text file. This is a very uh, quick example of such an SDP. I'm not going into the details, but just giving you a brief idea what is in there. For example, there's the name of the stream and there's the IP address of the session provider. Usually that's the device which is sending out the stream. There's also synchronization information. That is the uh, grandmaster clock where the particular sender is being referenced to. And we have an information about the media clock, which I'm not, not going to touch in this presentation, but with these two uh, attributes, a sender exactly knows what is the synchronization of that particular stream. Now, onwards to the type, um, it's apparently an audio stream which follows the RTP ADP profile, and the format of that stream is linear 24 bits at 48,000 kilo, uh, 48, hertz, 48 kilohertz and two channels. So we would have L16 instead of L24 or 44,100 if we are operating at uh, 44.1 kilohertz. We might have eight channels here as well. Then the next information is very important in order to uh, subscribe to the particular stream. It's the multicast address the stream is being sent to. Now, in contrast to unicast, where the IP address always is the IP address of the receiving device, so where a package should travel to, multicast addresses are virtual addresses. So they don't describe a particular device. It's a virtual address. And only by subscribing to this virtual address, the network will forward this particular packets or packets of this particular stream to the receivers. So the receiver definitely needs to know this multicast address. Otherwise, it can't even subscribe to this particular stream. And the final uh, important information is the packet time. That's the size of the packet or the amount of samples in a particular packet. Its uh, value is given in milliseconds, so P time says one. So the packet comprises of samples uh, which cover one millisecond of audio at 48 kilohertz. This is exactly, um, uh, at 48 kilohertz, this is exactly 48 samples, well, with the adequate number of channels which is given. So that's the session description protocol. And with that information, any receiver actually knows how to receive the stream, where it's synchronized to, and what is particularly in the stream. So what is missing? Of course, the connection management. Connection management is 
with the uh, most cases we use multicast. It's the IGMP protocol. It's what I described earlier with the multicast. So the receiver sends out an IGMP request and the network responds with the packets if it's aware of those packets. For unicast, there's another protocol which can be used to uh, set up connections, which is the SIP protocol, which is also part of the AES67 standard. You might have heard about SIP in context of voice over IP telephony. That's exactly the same uh, protocol which is being used here in AES67 as well. So typically, um, solutions like Ravenna, Dante, Livewire, they also have sorts or means of uh, discovery. So they would allow other participants of the same network technology to know what exactly is already on the network, what devices are available, what streams are available, and so forth. This is not part of AS67 deliberately um, because it's not a, techno a technologically required protocol or function in order to functionally set up the streams based on the same synchronization. Um, look at the, the very same principle with telephones. Uh, telephones basically have all of these functional blocks um, in them, but they don't have discovery. For discovery, they use what they call a telephone directory or your contact directory, whatsoever. So there are various means of actually getting the magic numbers, which are in the SDP. Uh, and once you have those numbers, you can make the connection. So that's why discovery, because there are so many different schemes out there, is not part of the mandatory requirements of AS67. So what's the current status of AS67? Well, it was initially uh, publicized in 2013. Uh, three years of work were preceding that one. Uh, we had uh, about 100 participants from all areas of the uh, professional market. We had a first revision in 2015. Basically, nothing was added. We were just looking at the standard and uh, uh, were, uh, were able to identify a few uh, ambiguities, uh, even errors in the uh, SDP description. So, and so we made a correction and verification, but didn't add anything new. So, full backward compatibility is preserved. Same is true for 2018 revision, which is uh, the latest revision of AS67. What has been added to the 2018 revision is what we call a fix. Now, that is nothing you would imagine like this. Uh, it's basically a protocol implementation performance statement. And if you're interested in this one, I urge you to uh, go to the AES website uh, at the uh, PIX repository where you can download summaries of those PIX for a number of devices uh, where the manufacturers already have built these PICs or PIC summaries and published those. So if you're interested there, just go to this uh, AES website and you will find a number of uh, PIC summaries already. And it's interesting to see how the options and varieties of AES67 are being supported by the individual devices. Current status is the work group is not closed. We are working on further topics like improving multicast, uh, addressing assignment algorithms, SDP enhancements, a homologation with ST2110, we'll come into this in a minute. Uh, and I can only urge, uh, encourage you to uh, join if you're interested uh, in how the AS67 standard develops. Otherwise, uh, it's very interesting work there and you get a lot of uh, insight into technology and to evolution of these kind of standards. So that's it about um, AS67 and we are now moving over to ST2110. It's a standard uh, issued by the SEMTI, uh, um, Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. Um, and the 2110 covers professional media over managed IP networks. So that's not going to deal with audio on its own, but it, uh, it specifies the transport synchronization and description of separate elementary essence streams. So that incorporates video, audio, and so data over managed IP network. Basically at any speed, it's open to whatever speeds are becoming available on networks. But managed IP network clearly means it's nothing you can use on the internet. By the way, AS67 also can't be used on the internet because the internet is not providing the quality of servers uh, and uh, services we need uh, for that kind of low latency transport. And the main uh, application for 2110 is real-time production, playout, and other professional media applications. So it's nothing which would replace um, you know, web distribution of uh, TV channels or anything like um, this. So basically, if we look at IP transport of uh, media signals, we uh, have two fundamental things called the bundled approach. Um, that is where audio, video, metadata, and synchronization information travel coherently in one IP stream 
which of course would uh, require extra work when we want to unpack uh, the separate essences. Um, the contrast is the essence-based approach where audio, video, and metadata are in individual streams um, and the synchronization is only kept through means of uh, PTP or sort of any synchronization means. Here's uh, a clear visualization um, between the different methods. We have 2022-6, which is the bundled approach. So you can see the active image uh, um, video area, the active image area. We have the audio as part of the hang bank uh, data space, and of course, other data which is stored in these particular areas. They are all encapsulated in one IP stream and travel to one IP address. That's perfect for already produced signals, which you need to transfer uh, from location A to location B and don't uh, expect to have uh, further processing, but only uh, redistribution of these um, signals. 2110 uh, goes the other way. Uh, transporting the essence uh, um, content individually. So with the active video, we only transport the video uh, image area in one stream. We extract the audio from the hang bank um, area and transport audio only. And then of course the metadata, which is in the hang bank is being transported by yet another stream on the network. So we have three different streams on the network using three different multicast addresses um, and they live independently on the network. So here again is a, a picture, an illustration of how this works. If we look at 2022-6, the bundled approach, if we look at a particular audio processor, if it only wants to do some processing on the audio, it has to receive the full SDI stream, um, de-embed the um, audio from it, process the audio, and regenerate a new SDI stream to put it back on the network. Quite a lot of work and also quite a lot of bandwidth requirement at the, uh, the network uh, IOs of that device. 2110 eases that uh, very, very much uh, because all the different essences are already living as individual streams on the network. So an audio processor only has to subscribe to the audio stream, process the audio and send back another processed audio streams onto the network and not to deal with the video or ancillary data at all. For a typical production setup, here's another uh, diagram illustrating the situation. There's an SDI signal, a 21 tender, a 2110 sender uh, in taking the SDI signal in would separate the essences from each other, send them as individual multicast streams on the network. A receiver can subscribe whatever streams are required, for example, to, uh, to, to, to compose the SDI signal again. But the benefit now comes into the game if we have other receivers on the network who are only interested in the audio signals, because of the multicast means they can subscribe to audio only, do whatever they need to do with the audio uh, further processing. Same is true on the sender side. A camera does not have to compose a complete SDI signal. Uh, it can just send up audio and uh, video and ancillary data and microphones can directly contribute to the network as well. So this is a different uh, approach between 20 to, uh, 2022-6 and 2110. Let's have a quick look at the, uh, the document structure of 2110 because it's not just one big document. It's um, uh, it parted into a, a variety or a numbered uh, sequence of documents. The dash 10 document describes everything about system definition and timings, about the transport layer, synchronization. It mostly refers back to uh, um, uh, other standards, RFCs, uh, IEEE standards like the 2059, the PTP standard and so on. The dash 20 talks about how we transport uncompressed active video in RTP packets. That goes back to another RFC. Um, then we have the dash 20 document, which is about traffic shaping and delivery timing for uncompressed active video. I'll come to that um, uh, in a minute. The dash 30 document is about PCM digital audio. How is that being transported? That basically refers back to AS67. Then we have the dash 31 document, which talks about how to bit transparently transport AES3 signals. Now, I assume that everybody is aware about the difference between PCM digital audio and AES3 audio. If not, we'll come up uh, in a few minutes. That format is fully uh, based on the Ravenna AMA24 format. So Ravenna, AM, Ravenna contributed actually to the dash 31 standard. Then we have the dash 40, which is the transport of the uh, SDI ancillary data. Um, so, synchronization and alignment. How is synchronization and alignment done in 2110? Guess what? It's based on the precision time protocol, and by now you know 
it's the very same thing which is used on AS67. So in that respect, 2110 and AS67 are absolutely identical. Next, we need media transport. Media transport in 2110, guess what? Is based on the real-time transport protocol, RFC 3550. You've seen that picture earlier. It's exactly the very same thing for 2110. And how is finally described what is in the RFC 3550 RTP packet? That is fully based, guess what, on the session description protocol. You have seen that before. So everything is uh, what is in place for AS67 is also valid for SD2110. Of course, since we are transporting video signals, we will see more information in the SDPs. This is just a copy of the audio stream we had in the AS67 section. A video stream typically will have more uh, uh, attributes or parameters describing, for example, the uh, particularities of the encoded video uh, in it. So let's uh, quickly look at the Dash 20 uh, uh, standard, which uh, defines how uncompressed active video essence is being uh, transported. First of all, uh, it is raster size uh, independent. So any raster size up to uh, 30K by 30K pixels can be transported with um, Dash 20. It is fully agnostic to any color sampling variant, to any bit depth, and to any uh, existing frame rates these days. So even high uh, motion capturing cameras uh, can transport their signals with uh, Dash 20. Uh, it also has full support for any um, uh, available HDR mechanism and it should also have a perfect match for anything which is coming up in the near future. Um, the benefit of having Dash 20 compared um, uh, against uh, 22-6, the SDI encapsulated transport, is the bandwidth. If we just look at video, we have a, about 30% bandwidth saving at 1080p50, for example. So in other words, we uh, use nearly a, a one gigabit less of bandwidth for transporting the active video uh, part uh, con in contrast to the um, dash 20, uh, 22-6. Dash all right, so if we transport video signals with that high amount of uh, data in it, so requiring that high amount of bandwidth and transporting multiple of those streams, we need to make sure that we are not overloading the net and not overloading the receivers. So first of all, that's absolutely clear. The network needs to have appropriate, uh, appropriate uh, bandwidth uh, capacity, but also we need to make sure that the way we transporting or sending out packets from the sender to the receivers would not cause any problems in the network or on the receiver side due to traffic congestion. And that is where the Dash 21 traffic shaping standard comes in. Now the problem is, as I explained, video flows at high data rates and multiple flows are concurrently traversed in the network. Now we only have limited buffer capacity in switches as well as in the receivers. And any constant data flow usually will not overload those buffer buffers as long as we stay within the switching capacity of the switch. So as long as we have a linear data in, uh, we can calculate how many of those streams can concurrently be transported by the switch. We have a linear um, data outflow. This is very comparable to what is um, uh, called a you know, water bucket model. So we have a, a buffer, a bucket. We are constantly uh, feeding water in and we are draining water out. And if all this goes in constant rates, we don't have any problem uh, with our uh, feeds. Now, the problem with 2110 is that there might be uh, situations where traffic is not so well regulated, for example, when it comes to software-based implementations. What happens if, if your, in, uh, your ingress streams are not at a constant flow rate, but have burstiness in them, it may happen. First of all, it, it, you, you definitely need a larger buffer because the, lover, uh, the buffer fill uh, level will variate among time. Uh, at the end, you still have a, a constant uh, a drain out of the switches, but the fill level will, uh, uh, will, will vary over time. And if you don't have enough uh, buffer uh, uh, there, your bucket may overflow. Now, um, here you just put um, some clothing underneath and you will get, uh, will be able to cope with the uh, overflowing water in a network. That is not the case. You can't just do that that way in a switch. If you have bursty data in and not enough buffer in the switches, your packets just may get dropped. And if they are dropped, they are not recoverable. So how do we um, target this? How do we deal with this? 
uh, in 2110, we define a center drain behavior. So it's a, it's a risk pacing and spacing, as well as some buffer requirements on the receiver side. Um, this is all based on the leaky bucket model, which you just have seen uh, in my water bucket model. Basically, here's again, different uh, diagram or illustration. There's a bucket, you have um, uh, vary, varying flows coming in and you have a smooth, uh, constant traffic going out of the bucket. And uh, for the sender traffic shaping, we have defined three models. We have a narrow linear model where all the packets out of a particular sender are drained uh, evenly distributed across a frame period. So we don't have variation uh, at the packet flow with this model. Then we have a narrow model, which closely follows the SDI signal timing. So at times where the SDI signal has active video, packets are getting spaced out evenly and no packets are going to be spaced out during the uh, uh, bank periods. And then we have a white model, which supports uh, software-based implementations where packet spacing cannot be that evenly distributed on the eager side of things. So by defining these three different, three different models, Here's again an illustration, narrow linear, over the uh, frame, of this is the time of one frame, you see packets are coming out of a very evenly spaced timing. Um, if we have the narrow model, we have packets coming out of the uh, sender. Uh, whenever there are active packets, there are no packets during the uh, bank signal, uh, signals, and then it takes up again, but they are evenly distributed. You can see the median uh, flow, the average bit rate. This and the software implementation may have uh, a very distribution of packets being sent out over time. So the, uh, the moving average may um, yeah, go up and down throughout the time of a frame. But these are defined in very strict timing models set forth in the 21 standard. And uh, the, uh, the, the way a stream is being sent out by the sender is again signalized in the SDP. So the receiver exactly knows, oh, well, here's a stream which follows the wide a definition, so I need to provide more buffer because um, I need to cope with varying um, fill levels in my receive buffer. Uh, as this is impact on the buffer requirements. So um, this can be talked about uh, on, a, on a complete presentation on its own, but I don't want to go through this uh, here. We uh, move on with uh, dash 22, which is the video compressed uh, payload definition. So again, it's uh, independent and agnostic to all the uh, various um, picture attributes and the important thing it specifies how a constant bitrate codec has to uh, packetize uh, its information. Uh, it does not specify a particular codex, uh, so uh, different codecs can be used with together with dash 22. They just need to be registered in the SAMP registry and then it's signaled in the SDP again what type of codec is being used with what coding parameters when it's transported with the dash 22 transport standard. Dash 30 is the linear PCM audio. We can uh, shorten this now because we know it's AS67. However, um, SEMT has added a few constraints uh, to the Dash 30 with respect to AS67. Basically, it looks like this. Uh, we have AS67, the mandatory requirements, which are basically fully in line with the Dash 30 level A definitions, the only mandatory definitions. We have the optional possibilities in AS67. These are <coughs> fully um, covered by the level B definitions um, of 702110. However, there are these uh, constraints um, which make it now a bit different to AS67, but only on a deep system level, which only AS67 implementers would have to know uh, in order to make their devices 2110 compliant. For now, we can say, Every AS67 device basically is compliant to 2110 and vice versa. If you're interested in the differences, there's a white paper on the AIMS website. As well, we will touch uh, on these things in the uh, follow-up uh, webinar on May 12th, which is about the audio files. Um, so AS3 audio is covered by Dash 31. Dash 31 uh, defines how to transport AS3. If, for those of you who do not know, AS3 is L24 PCM plus additional metadata bits defined by the AS uh, EDU standard, the PCUV bits. Um, and with AS3, you can now transport not only PCM encoded audio, but non PCM audio, as well as any other real time data formats uh, defined by another SEMTI standard. 
Dolby E would be uh, one example, um, these type of um, data which can be transported with AS3. So it's an important uh, payload definition and that is fully based as I mentioned earlier on Ravenna's AMA24. Transport, what we do basically, we have the L24 section in the RTP payload, but have to add another byte for the PCUV bits and the block and frame start bits um, to accompany the L24. So basically adding just one byte of payload. Of course, that needs to be signaled in the STP. So we are adding a new qualifier here, a new attribute, AMA24 instead of L24. And all other STP parameters uh, remain the same. So it's not rocket science to actually implement Dash 31 or the Ravenna AMA24 format into devices to support Dash 31 as well. So uh, how is the compatibility between uh, Dash 31 and AS67 and 70? Now we know Dash 31 um, is basically the same as AS67, except for the few constraints, uh, constraints I mentioned, which mostly are uh, satisfied by uh, the today's AS67 implementations anyway. However, when Dash 31 comes into game, AS67 is not part of the game anymore. However, it's the Ravenna implementation, which fully covers Dash 31 and any AS67 implementation. Adding this capability can also instantly uh, take part in, in the Dash 31 based um, traffic exchange. So finally, Dash 40. Uh, not much to say. It's uh, coping with the Hank and Bank ancillary data, which is typically transported in, in, the, in the SDI Hank and Bank space. Um, so time code, closed caption, subtypes, whatever is in there. It's not intended to transport the audio, which is also stored in there, because for the audio, we have the Dash 31 standard. So it's just the non-audio data in the Hank and Bank data space, which is intended to be transported with Dash 30, uh, Dash 40 standard. So further documents currently under development within 2110, we have 23, uh, which defines how to transport uh, higher bandwidth streams uh, on lower bandwidth links. We have Dash uh, 24, which defines how to transport SD signals within 2110. Then we have Dash 41, which is the so-called extensible fast metadata transport. That is very similar to what we currently work on ASX242, the metadata, the real-time metadata transport. Actually, both standard organizations are aligning and trying to come to conclude on one single standard mechanism, still carrying their own numbers, but uh, describing the very same mechanisms so they don't get any constraints or any differences uh, between them, just like AS67 and 2110-30. If you look uh, at the Ravenna uh, event page, which is on uh, ravenna-network.com, uh, trade show events, you will already see the uh, slides and the uh, recording of um, the previous um, uh, webinar. We will, of course, make this webinar slides and recording as well available, so you can share with colleagues or uh, just to review uh, any interesting parts. Um, also, we have a number of resources available on the Ravenna website, on the AIMS website, as well as on the SEMPTI websites. Um, so uh, go ahead and have a look. Uh, also check the schedule of upcoming webinars, which uh, have a more detailed view at 2110, ingredients, synchronization. Um, we will provide information on how to implement Ravenna into devices. We will have practical webinars on how to make connect connections uh, or set up ST uh, AS67 streams and make connections. All this is coming up, so please make sure that you check back our events page on the uh, Ravenna website. And uh, yes, for today, uh, we all made it. So thank you for joining in. Thank you for attending and hope to see, um, so to see all of you basically uh, on the upcoming webinars. Thanks for your time. And as always, any questions can be forwarded to the mail address you just um, see in this final slide. Thank you very much. Andreas, on behalf of all attendees, thank you very much indeed. And uh, see you in two weeks. <laughs>